to you, God. Just ask you, please forgive us for our sins, God. We just ask you to, to uh, take these songs and, and bless our hearts, God, and prepare us for the, for the words that you uh, have prepared for us, God. God, we uh, we take time to uh, to think about those that are and ask you to bless those that lost loved ones, God, Taylor family and other families. God, just uh, bring peace to our heart as we as we sit here and enjoy your word, God. All this we ask in Jesus' name we pray for you. Amen. Amen. 253. 1st, 2nd, and last, 253.
Brother Terry Beasley, would you bless our offering this morning? <clears throat> Lord, we just want to very humbly and prayerfully, Lord, thank you for this opportunity and Lord, just allowing us to come out. And Lord, you know every situation. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to lead us and guide us. And most of all, Lord, to supply us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord, the, Lord, the kind that when Solomon asked, you gave him. Lord, how we fit into you and, Lord, your words, and Lord, just to be prepared. And Lord, just thank you for this time, Lord, please be with Brother Joey and, <clears throat> Lord, Bless him and, and Lord, allow him to present your word, Lord, and we receive it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
this time Co Lincoln's going to come and bless our hearts with a song this morning before I bring the message. You know, we talk about uh, discipleship not very much, like it seemed like we used to talk about a lot. Discipleship training, you know, we hear that. And now being a disciple of Christ, I don't know, I just don't hear it like I, like I used to. I've never walked out into your cemetery that, that I can remember. But you know, a lot of you know who, who are out there that were warriors, that were prayer warriors, work warriors, steadfast disciples that lived their life as if they were Christ. They wanted to be like Christ. That's what the word Christian means anyway. We're to be Christ-like. You know, when you think of a, a battle, you, you think of the, uh, the ones that are out front, especially the, the banner carrier. He's, uh, he stuck himself up uh, with a, he's a pretty good target. Something, some, something to aim at, to be shot down. And once he is, you hope that one of the soldiers behind him is watching. And hardly before that banner can hit the ground, they've grabbed it. And they march on. And then they're the banner carriers. The loved ones and people out in the cemetery that were banner carriers, when they died, who picked it up? Did you? Did you? Or has it laid there? Discipleship, following Christ, being Christ-like, and carrying that banner. If you're carrying one, if you know of someone in this church today that's carrying the banner for Christ and they go home to glory, are you going to pick it up? It must be carried. It must be held up. And we're the ones to do it. shut it down. They tell me something happened. Some say he lost his mind. But ever since that afternoon, this is what you'll find. An old man on a corner where he used to sell his show. Now he shouts what sounds like foolishness as the people come and go. New lives for old. Warm hearts for cold. I got a deal for you today. Come on, step right this way. Puts it in the paper, he goes from door to door. The people say he's such a fool to come back for more. Old friends are mostly puzzled, they don't know what to say. Cause ever since that afternoon, well, he's just been that way. It's like the old man died and someone came and took his place. 
Now he stands there just to bellowing, but a smile on his old wrinkled face. New Come on, step right this way and get your new lives for home. Remembering this story as I once passed through that town I thought I ought to stop and see if he was still around There was a lady on the corner where I'd heard he'd always stand and she chuckled when I asked her where I might find that man She said Thank God that crazy fool finally died last spring. I said, well, that's okay. I'll take his place. Because I'm pushing the same thing. New small, but we are richly and wonderfully blessed here in Amen. Amen. I tell you, I'm so thankful. Uh, so thankful for that message in song and speaking from the heart Lane, and also Sandy being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and speaking from her heart. We needed both of that this morning. And we thank, you. thank you both. What shall it profit a man or a woman if he or she gains the whole world and loses his or her soul? And what shall a man or woman give in exchange for his or her soul? Brother Mike Saunders, would you please pray with us this morning? Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance that we live in the country to get to come here into your house and worship you without fear of anything. And stay with us and go with us through our lives and through these coming weeks and months when our country goes through the turmoil it's in. And bless us and take good care of us. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. 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 According to the words of Jesus, our soul is our most prized possession. Our soul is more precious and more valuable than anything or anybody in life. When the light of the moon and the sun and the stars all go out, when this vast universe is replaced by God's new heaven 
and new earth, our, our souls will still exist. There's nothing in this world, gold, silver, any kind of expensive jewels, that's worth more than our soul because our soul goes on for all eternity. We haven't always existed like God has. God is the only one who has always existed and He always existed and He always will exist in both directions, both path, past and future. There was a time when we weren't. But there will never be a time when we aren't. A person's soul is going to exist long after this physical life is over with. It will be in heaven with God or to be in hell totally separated from God. But our soul will exist from, from now on. I want us to turn in our Bibles this morning, if you have them with you, to the book of Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 38. And let's see here what Jesus has to say about our most precious possession, our souls, and also what He has to say about discipleship. Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. Now Jesus and His disciples were out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road He asked His disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You're the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke the word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus here in these passages of Scripture has an interesting conversation with Peter. And then Jesus gives us the steps of discipleship. A disciple is a student, a follower of Jesus. And being a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean you follow Jesus just one day a week or just a few weeks or a few years. It's a 24-7 lifelong commitment to keep on following and keep, keep on learning. You know, you can't open the Word of God without something new jumping out at you each time. Jesus doesn't call us to just be a believer. He calls us to be His disciples. And He also calls us to be disciple makers. And as Colleen said, you don't hear much about discipleship anymore. I know a lot of churches who have gotten new members to come in and they stayed for just a short while and they left. And the reason was because we, as a body of believers, we didn't do our part to disciple the new people coming in. They're still babes in Christ. 
And they need discipleship. You can't be a discipleship maker until you are first a true disciple. And in this passage, Jesus shows us some basic steps that a disciple takes. And the first one is this. Believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. Believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus asked His disciples, Who do you say I am? And old boisterous Peter spoke up. He usually says the wrong thing when he speaks up. But this time he got it right for a change. And he said, You are the Christ. Now this period of time that uh, we're talking about here was about midways of Jesus' uh, ministry, His three-year ministry here on this earth. And Jesus was normally bombarded with people coming to Him, uh, wanting to see a healing uh, miracle or wanting to uh, be fed by a miracle. So Jesus and His disciples uh, decided to go on a little retreat uh, to get away from the crowds for just a little while. And they went to a city in the northern part of Galilee called Caesarea Philippi. And this city could very well be called uh, the Sin City because of all the stuff that went on there. There in the temple there in the city, uh, they worshipped an idol. They worship an idol, and that was their God. And this, this uh, idol was half man and half goat. And they called him Pan, was his name. And uh, I imagine this, this thing was a party, probably a pretty creepy looking kind of thing. And there was this huge spring that gushed out water out of the mouth of this cave on the side of this big mountain there. And the temple was built over this gushing spring of water. And this particular spot was known as the Gates of Hades. And all kinds of evil went on there in this place, including human sacrifices. It was a very, very wicked place. Now why Jesus chose to visit this place isn't real clear to us. Some say that it's because, uh, probably because there wasn't any Jews there. But this was a time that Jesus was reflecting back on His ministry. And he was looking ahead to, to his ministry also. And he asked the disciples what the people were saying about him. They said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. And then Peter spoke up again and said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Lord. Now most of us grew up hearing what others had to say about Jesus. And if you were blessed, He brought you up in a, a Christian home where you heard these words a lot. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But when you get right, right down to it, it's not what others say about Jesus. It's what you say about Jesus. Right now, Jesus is asking you who do you say I am? It's not enough for you to say, well, my parents or my grandparents or my spouse or my best friend uh, says that you're the Son of God. And you can't get by with saying, well, Brother Joey says that you're the Son of God and the only way to heaven. Each person individually has got to answer that question for themselves. The Bible clearly says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is, your, it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. In the book of Acts, the early church made this profession of faith most of the time when they, they were baptized. Now let me share a, an interesting fact with you. Every year, uh, a Roman citizen had to uh, pay tax, just like we do, an annual tax. And they, they also had to do something else. They had to say these particular words. They had to say, Kaiser Esten Curious. Now those words mean, Caesar is Lord. But the radical disciples and followers of Jesus 
They refused to say that Caesar is Lord. And they'd say, Isis Esten Curious, which means Jesus is Lord. And as a result of them saying this, they got charged with treason against Rome and, and they got thrown in jail or, or worse. Uh, some of them were killed as a result of it because it was considered treason. Confessing Jesus is Lord is the very first step in discipleship. The next step as a person continues to grow as a Christian is to get their ego out of their life. Now that was some pretty unexpected words coming from Jesus that He said to Paul. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus explained the, the characteristics of a true disciple. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And after Peter made that powerful uh, confession during his uh, conversation with Jesus, he was probably feeling pretty good about himself. He's probably swelled up a little bit with pride and was patting himself on the back. And while he was busy patting himself on the back, Jesus was uh, telling the disciples the schedule for the rest of his ministry. And he told them that, that he would go through great suffering. He told them that he would be rejected by the Jewish leaders and that they, they would put him to death. And that on the third day he would rise again. An old proud Peter, he didn't want to hear none of this stuff. He didn't want to hear anything about failure or pain or suffering or death. He was focused on being on a winning team. He was so full of pride and, and ego. He was, he was saying in his mind, he was saying to himself, well, I'm the Messiah's right hand man. And this means riches and honor and glory. But Mr. Big Shot Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke Jesus. Just imagine that, this big old fisher, fisherman uh, rebuking the Son of God saying something like, I don't want to hear anyone any more of this silly talk about you dying now, Jesus. We've got a good thing going here. We're going to win big. Oh boy. That proud way of talking really set him up for a show enough rebuke from Jesus. And in front of all the other disciples, Jesus looked Peter right in the eyes and He said, Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like a man, not like God. He told Peter that he was full of selfish pride and that his ego was in charge. He said, you could never be a disciple unless you deny yourself. Now this kind of denying doesn't mean that, uh, to deny yourself of something like a Coke or a nap in the afternoon or, or a piece of pound cake. It means you have to deny self. Think of yourself as your ego. A person with a self or ego directed life has a legalistic attitude. They have uh, 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 ugly thoughts. They have a lot of guilt. They have discouragement. They have a critical spirit. They have frustration. and They're full of fear all the time. And we could, we could keep going on uh, describing a person with an ego. But the list also includes Excuse me, a weak prayer life. And it also includes no desire to study God's Word. A self-centered person is all about themselves. It's all about what they think, what they feel, and what they want. But a genuine <clears throat> disciple of Jesus says, it's not about me. It's not about me at all. It's all about Jesus. We need to look at ourselves and make sure we don't have an ego. There's no place for an ego in service to God. Especially in the pulpit, as I have said many times. Then Jesus gave us the next step when He said, if anyone will come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. A person carrying a cross had only one destination and he knew that he was going to die. He was headed uh, to his death. He knew that. 
It was always a one-way trip. Now, for us to take up our cross doesn't mean that we carry a cross around in our pocket. However, I do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I love my pocket cross. I keep my pocket cross. But it's not about that. And some folks think that their cross to bear is some kind of physical ailment. You know, we've all heard people talk about their ailments and say something like this, I guess this is just my cross that I'll, and I'll just have to bear it. That's not what we're talking about here at all. Jesus isn't talking about aches and pains. He's talking about dying. And it isn't a physical death. It's not a physical death. But death to self. Death, death to self. Death to ego. After you have denied self, you must constantly subject your ego to death. In the book of Luke, Jesus says we must take up His cross daily. Daily. So this isn't just a, a one-time thing. Now since all of our sins were nailed to Jesus on the cross, and since self and ego is the catalyst for all our sin problems. Our ego was crucified with Jesus. It was nailed to the cross with Jesus. We just all have to realize that. I think Galatians 2.20 sums it up. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I want us to think about this. There really was someone that literally was crucified with Christ. And it was that thief on the cross right beside him. And while he was hanging there, he knew that his life was about to be over. And he looked over at Jesus. And Jesus was bleeding and dying too. And the last thing Jesus looked like was a king because he had been beaten beyond recognition. <clears throat> But the thief said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that simple little profession of faith was all it took. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. When we're crucified with Jesus, we'll be like that thief. He didn't care about what people thought about him. His ego and pride was long gone. People could have yelled up at him and said, you sure are ugly and stupid. Go steal something now. It didn't bother him because he was crucified with Christ. He wasn't afraid of stirring up the Roman soldiers or the Jewish leaders for talking with Jesus because he was crucified with Christ. The only thing that mattered to him was Jesus. If we'll put ourselves on that cross with Jesus and look into His eyes, you lose the desire to look at anything else. Sin becomes repulsive to you. Wandering in lustful eyes becomes repulsive. Sinning altogether, no matter what it is, becomes repulsive. The next step to discipleship is to place Jesus on the throne of your life and listen to Him and obey Him. And Jesus continued and said, if anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. And to follow Jesus means to go wherever He says go. Following Jesus means to walk in His footsteps. Now I don't believe that this means that you have to live a perfect life to be a disciple. That's impossible anyway. There was only one perfect person and that was Jesus. But that's something that we should strive for. But we should have a desire always to follow Jesus and to obey Him and be like Him and do the best we can and be, to be like Him. It means a will in our being to choose to obey God in all things, in all areas of our life. Some of the characteristics of a Christ-directed life over a self-directed life is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. 
It's a life that's guided by the precious Holy Spirit. And then the last step of discipleship is don't waste your life. Lose yourself in the cause of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save or live for me only, his life will lose or waste it. But whoever loses or surrenders his life for me and for the gospel will save it. A life that matters for all eternity. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? A lot of people don't even know they have a soul. Isn't that sad? A lot of people don't even know what that's talking about. If you ask them, they wouldn't know about it. They never give it a second thought. Your soul is the real you that lives inside your body. It's who you are. Jesus has told us to love God with all our being, with all our heart, and with all our soul, and with all our strength, and with all our mind. I want to share a story with you this morning about a, a pastor. He was a German pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he lived during the time of the Adolf Hitler regime. And he wrote a classic book entitled The Cost of Discipleship. He knew a good bit about discipleship and he knew uh, about the priceless gift of our souls. And he wrote these words in his book. He said, When Christ calls a man, He bids him come and die. He was talking about dying to self. But Pastor Bonhoeffer came to know that it was more than just dying to self. It became a physical death also for him. And from the very beginning of Adolf Hitler's rule in Germany, Pastor Bonhoeffer opposed him. Hitler would use the German churches to spread his message about the uh, Aryan supremacy and hatred against the Jews. And Pastor Bonhoeffer was a part of a small group called the Confessing Church. Uh, and they all saw the evil of the leadership of Hitler. Hitler was called De Führer, which means the leader. And Pastor Bonhoeffer was speaking on the radio in Berlin on one occasion, and he said, there can only be one Führer for Christians, and it isn't Adolf Hitler. It's Jesus Christ. He didn't get to finish his radio broadcast before they pulled the plug. He was part of a group that made several attempts to have Hitler assassinated. But Pastor Bonhoeffer was arrested by the Gestapo and he spent two years in a concentration camp. And just three weeks, just three weeks before the war in Germany ended, Pastor Bonhoeffer was let out of the prison with several other prisoners. They were ordered to strip down naked and they were led to the gallows to be hung. Now there was a doctor there who claimed to have witnessed the death and, uh, of, of Pastor Bonhoeffer and he wrote later, he said, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor praying fervently to God and I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. And at the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and he, he climbed up the few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. And his death came just a few seconds later. This doctor said in almost 50 years that he worked as a doctor, he had never seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. In Pastor Bonhoeffer's last letter, to a pastor friend who lived in England. He said, this is the end, but for me, it's the beginning of life. Pastor Bonhoeffer didn't lose his life. He gained it. 
he lost himself in a cause greater than himself. And as a result, he impacted millions and millions of disciples. Our most precious possession is our souls. Let's make sure that we're not wasting it, wasting our lives. Let's lose our lives. Let's lose our soul in a cause that's greater than ourselves. Pastor John Piper said this, made this statement. The opposite of wasting your life is to live by a single soul, satisfied, soul satisfying passion for the supremacy of God in all things. Let me say that again. The opposite of wasting your life is to live by a single soul satisfying passion for the supremacy of of God in all things. If you want your life to count, let's be like the Apostle Paul and declare, I decided to know nothing but you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Ever since I prepared this message, I have found myself saying, I have decided to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If you'll focus on that, uh, my goodness, you can draw close as you want to to God. Yeah. Like never before, we need to keep these words in our hearts. I believe that. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's been, it has been said already this morning, the devil is hard at work because he knows his time is short here on this earth. He's trying to pull the plug on us, just like uh, they pull the plug on Pastor Bonhoeffer. The, the devil's trying to pull the plug in the lives of every Christian. And he's working on every aspect of our lives. He's working on our homes. He's working on our families. He's working on our churches. He's working on our government. He's working on our country. There is nothing in our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ that the devil won't try to destroy. Like never before, stand strong for Jesus. Don't waver in your faith. Pray for our country. Pray for one another. Pray for lost souls before it's too late. Keep looking up and ask God for wisdom and strength to persevere until He comes again or until we go to Him. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message that You gave us from Your Word this morning, Father. Help us all to be aware of how precious our souls are and how important it is to follow You. How important it is, Father, to be Your disciples. We are Your arms and we are Your feet and we are Your hands in this world. Help us to be the ambassadors that we should be for You. Father, we thank you for this, this congregation this morning. And we ask your blessings to be poured out on each one. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that, that guides and, and leads us. And Father, during this special time of invitation, we pray that you will be glorified and that if there's someone here who needs a special touch from you, that this will be their time. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Will, what is our hymn of invitation this morning? 503, first and the last, 503. 503 as we stand and sing.
thank the Lord for what we have experienced in worship this hour and uh, give Him all the glory for it. Let's be sure to keep those uh, who have prayer needs in all of our prayers. Uh, due to sickness and, and, and grief, let's remember those who are hurting. And uh, Does anybody have anything they'd like to share before we dismiss? Okay, if not, I'm going to ask Brother Bill White to dismiss us, please. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my failure. Forgive me for the prayer that I'm just going to say. Lord, it's straight from my heart. Lord, the situation that we're in today, we all fear it. We're natural, Lord. But Lord, I can't help but just thank you. When I was turned 60 years old, I had some heart trouble to strike me. Pneumonia strike me, Lord. It really got my attention. I'm saying this, Lord, to say that you are in control. I've been through a lot in the last 19 years, Lord, but you've led me through it. You've been right by me. And you went to the cross, Lord, for my soul. Thank you, Lord, for it. I thank you so much for our church. I just got to say that I was just thrilled to be able to come today. I've just recently been through some different situation and problems. To see my church family, to be with my church family, and hear you word profess, Lord. Lord, let's don't let this situation that we're going through now take our faith away from you, Lord. Let's hold our faith in you and just know that you're in control no matter what happens. And as we walk each day, Lord, let it show in our appearance to others. Lord, give me the strength to be the man that you want me to be, the father and the husband, and the man in the community that be pleasing to thee. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I trust you to you, Lord, and I hold my head high honoring you. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.